All of us have uh, either heard about or thought about or dreamed about or imagined what it would be like to find a, a buried treasure. The greatest buried treasure that was ever found in history was actually found in 1859. It was found not too far from here. It was in Nevada. It amounted to, at current estimates, $15 billion was found buried in Nevada in the year 1859. But uh, the way the story goes is this. There were two miners, O'Reilly and McLaughlin, who had staked their claim at the head of the Six Mile Canyon in the Nevada Territory. Uh, they were notorious drinkers, but they were also pretty good prospectors, and so they were digging around in the hills looking for gold, and as they dug through, they finally hit a small vein of gold. And so they chipped out some, ran back to the assayer's office, sold it, and in the midst of that, began to drink away their, their winnings or their findings, and McLaughlin and O'Reilly were sitting at the bar with a third prospector who in their inebriated condition convinced them that it was his stake that they had found that on and he went down and to the assayer's office and in their drunkenness got them to sign off the rights to the Six Mile Canyon and a guy named Harvey Comstock took over the canyon. Well. As you know, you've probably heard the word Comstock, as in Comstock Lode. He went in looking for gold, and he worked that little vein until it went into quartz. And it's hard to get gold out of quartz, and so he was complaining every day in 1859. He would come trudging and barely able to move up to the assayer's office, and he would bring his little tiny pile of gold he found, and he would set it up onto the counter, and he'd say, I can't believe how hard it is mining in the Six Mile Canyon. He says, my picks, my shovels, my wagons, my mules. And then he took his boot off and set it on the counter. He says, and even my boots are covered with this heavy gray mud. Well, the assayer took out his knife and said, do you mind if I check your boots? And he pushed the gold aside and he scraped the gray, sticky mud that was fouling up the operation of Harvey Comstock's mine. And he assayed it and found it to be worth $2,000 a ton. That's a dollar a pound of pure, almost pure silver that was laying on the surface of the Six Mile Canyon. 13 feet deep in places, almost pure silver laying on the ground. And old Harvey was walking around with a fortune on his mules, his boots, his picks, and his shovels. Well, I'd like you to start shoveling with me right now. Look in the Gospel by Mark, and I want to dig for gold in the Gospels. And this is just uh, an example. I'm taking you through on, on a method that, that was taught to me many years ago when I was in school on how to, to recover great truths from the Bible by just doing a simple Bible study method. And what we're going to look at is three things. First of all, we're going to see Christ through his actions. And I want you to, with me, uh, mark in, in the Gospel by Mark things Jesus did. Secondly, how he described himself, his self-descriptions, his actions, what he did, his self-descriptions, what he said. And then finally, his reputation, uh, what others said about him. You know what the first thing we discover about Jesus Christ when we listen to other people talk about him? In the Gospel by Mark, the people that rubbed shoulders with Jesus Christ, the people that knew him personally, the people that met him, that talked with him, that walked with him, that ate with him, that got to know him on an intimate, personal level, they were overwhelmingly aware that he was greater than the greatest of all humans, that he was not merely a man, but he was divine. You know, the Bible teaches us Jesus Christ is divine. And if we listen to the voices of those closest to Jesus, we see that Jesus Christ, when he lived and walked on earth, there was no doubt. In fact, if you study closely, and as we go through, you'll see this. The Pharisees and Sadducees never once denied any miracle Jesus did. They didn't say he didn't do them. They just didn't like him and wanted to get rid of him. They didn't say he was a fake. They didn't say that he didn't raise the dead. They didn't say he didn't heal. They didn't say he didn't walk on water. They didn't say that, that he couldn't change stuff, multiply bread, and, and change water into wine. What they said is we don't want him around here because the light is too bright, and we like the darkness rather than light. And so, first of all, in verse 7, the first thing we notice about his reputation is that others said that he was divine. Look at verse 
24, because we have another testimony, and, and uh, chapter 1, verse 24 has the second of our little studies about how to see Christ uh, through his, his reputation, what others said. And this is fascinating. Um, I'll start up in 21 so we don't pull it out of context. Then they went into Capernaum, a little town on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Jesus always went to where the people were, and, and uh, they gathered to look at the scriptures, and, and he went there to those willing minds and began to teach them. And they were astonished at his teaching. Uh, usually the rabbinic teaching was just all of them quoting each other. And they'd say, well, Rabbi so-and-so said this, and Rabbi so-and-so said that, and Rabbi so-and-so said this, and they just stopped there. And, and it really wasn't the Bible being taught. It was just a collection of opinions and traditions and, and a lot of different uh, uh, concoctions that they'd had. They made all these rules up. But Jesus came in and he explained to them what the Bible meant. And they were astonished. For he taught them as one, verse 22, having authority, not as the scribes. And now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. Verse 23. Now, every time we go to Israel, we were just there a few weeks ago, I, I always think of this. Because the way the, the Capernaum synagogue sets, the Sea of Galilee is out the door, and the entrance is right here. And so if you're standing at the entrance, you're looking, or if you're teaching, you're looking straight out at the water. And so everybody had their backs to the door, and they were looking to the front, where Jesus was up in the front, and he would sit down and would teach the scriptures. They would read from the scroll, and he would, they all, the teacher always sat, and so he sat down. And while he was sitting and everybody was intently listening to him, someone comes in the back door. And if you know anything about Capernaum, it's right on the, on the shore, but there are these hills around with caves, and, and there were many people that lived in the caves that were demonized. And one of these demonized people, it says in verse 23, uh, who had an unclean spirit, comes stumbling in to the service. And he walks in the back door. And remember, demons are not omniscient. Neither are they omnipresent. And so he just happened to be inhabiting that body of that person at that time, or maybe there were several of them, and, and was impelling this man to go in there. And as this demonized man walks in, the demon, looking out his eyes, looks up front and goes, Oh, no. Look who I just ran into. And look what he says. This is fascinating. He cried out, saying in verse 24, now, this is Christ's reputation. This is what someone else is saying about him. This is the testimony from the other side. This is a testimony from the occult. This is a testimony from the demon world. This is a testimony from the spirits. The word demon means intelligence. Uh, demons are thousands of years old. They are incredibly intelligent. Because they've existed so long, they are an intelligent spirit. In fact, the only thing demon means is that it's a spirit of intelligence. They're very smart. This very smart creature inhabiting a human body starts screaming. The word cried out, kradzo, means that it wasn't, uh, you know, one whimper. Like this morning in one of the services, some baby let out one little, ah! It wasn't that. It was a, a very loud screaming. And, 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 it isn't, and what's neat about Greek, by the way, in... in um, the Hebrew language, the tenses, it's very hard to tell whether something happened in the past once or never or just in the present or whatever. Hebrew is very vague. It's an oriental language. Greek is very precise. You can tell in the Greek language if something's going to happen in the future once or many times, if it's happening in the present once or continuously, whether it happened in a singular time in the past or a few times in the past or if it continues from the past to the future. There are so many tenses of Greek, it almost kills you to memorize them all. This tense is that he kept on screaming. Now, everybody's got their back to the door looking at Jesus. Jesus is astonishing them with his teaching, and all of a sudden, this... And if you've ever seen a demon-possessed man, even or person, that is overwhelming. Because their eyes bulge out, their faces contort into shapes that humans don't usually ever get to make, and their voices are a very raspy, horrible sound. And so this, almost like a walking monster, starts just screaming, and his face is contorted, and his eyes are bugging out, and he's walking toward the front of the service, and everybody's already astonished. And here comes this, this person they were afraid of anyway. They didn't like demonized people. And listen to what he's saying. Let us 
as in multiple demons, alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Now, do you think Jesus was wearing a name tag? I mean, see, the demons, the, they see the spirit. See, that's, that's what's so amazing. Uh, when the seven sons of Siva came to cast out the demon, and, and this demonized um, person in the book of Acts, the demon looked at the seven sons of Siva and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, who are you? They, that demon knew that they were powerless and impotent before him, and so that demon beat them up and sent them out uh, bleeding and, and their clothes stripped off. This demon looked through with spiritual eyes at Jesus Christ and saw him, knew exactly who he was, and then look at the next part of verse 24. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. And this demon quotes the most often repeated title of God in the book of Isaiah. He says, you are the Holy One of God. Now, just for a second, I'll explain it to you. Let's look back in the book of Isaiah. Start in Isaiah 10 and verse 17. This shows that demons know a lot of the Bible. Uh, The devil knows a lot of the Bible. Look at Isaiah. We were there this morning. Chapter 10 in verse 17. And I'm going to show you many of these uh, little titles that that, uh, point to who this demon said that Jesus was. Isaiah 10, and I'll just show you five or six in Isaiah. It's 30 times repeated. So the light of Israel, Isaiah 10, 17, will be for a fire. And his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and briars in one day. Now, if you have a modern translation of the Bible, Holy One is capitalized because this is a divine title. Uh, The next one is in verse 20, same chapter. And it will come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In truth, see, the Lord is the Holy One of Israel. That's one of the great, great uh, majestic titles. Now look at chapter 17 of Isaiah, verse 7. And by the way, if you're looking, if you're uh, uh, reading through the whole Bible, as I've told you before, one of the great studies is to actually take a marker and mark all these titles and names and descriptions of the Lord. You'll use up more than one marker pen, but you will find one of the richest studies that there is in the Bible is studying the name, which is above every name. And, and this holy one you would find 30 times in this book. But in Isaiah uh, chapter 17 and verse 7, it says, In that day, uh, and, and this is uh, speaking of the, this is called the little apocalypse of Isaiah, uh, from 13 on talks about future events and judgment and tribulation uh, scenes are talked about. Uh, but look at verse 7. In that day a man will look to his maker and his eyes will have respect for the Holy One of Israel. Now one of the, the, the main um, ways that the Hebrew mind communicated was in a form called parallelism. And what they do is they put two things that are parallel side by side to enhance and to explain and to amplify the meaning. And so in this construction, if you look at verse 17, it says, well, man will look to his what? Maker. Who is his maker? The parallel term is, at the end of verse 7, the Holy One of Israel. So the Holy One of Israel is your maker, and your maker is the Holy One of Israel. And so what it's saying is the maker of all, the creator, is the Holy One of Israel, and that demon walked in that synagogue and looked up at the front and saw its creator. And it just started screaming. It says, you're the Holy One of Israel. Okay, another one, that, and they get, they get very excited. Look at chapter 29 of Isaiah. And that's why uh, if, if you don't get excited about studying the Gospels, then study the Old Testament and find the names of God. Isaiah 29 and verse 19 If you're a Bible marker, you should have verse 13 marked of chapter 29. These people draw near me with their mouths. They honor me with their lips, but they have removed their hearts far from me. Uh, Their fear toward me is taught by commandment of men. Uh, That's a danger. I hope that you can never sit here and sing songs with us and have your mind off in, in, 
you know, back home at your job or, or forward at your next event, because that's what he's talking about. It, talking about people that can say all the right words, but their heart is, you know, somewhere else. Uh, and that, God said, is unacceptable worship. But uh, especially in 29, verse 19, it says this. It says, The humble also shall increase their joy in the Lord, and the poor among men shall rejoice, here it is, in the Holy One of Israel. So again, the parallelism, the Lord is the Holy One of Israel. Uh, look at verse 23 again. Uh, but when he sees his children, the work of, his, of my hands in his midst, they will hallow my name and hallow the Holy One of Jacob and fear the God of Israel. Um, and hallowed be thy name, you know, from the, the disciples' prayer, the Holy One of Jacob, which uh, is interesting. Jacob is the bad guy, right? Israel is his new name, but, but God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He identifies with failures and with sinners and with those who lapsed and everything else they did. And he's the God that gives a second chance. But notice that the name, the Holy One, and the God of Israel are all parallel, and that's who this demon's talking about. Now, just real quickly, one more. Chapter 48 of Isaiah and verse 17. This is one of my more favorite uh, uses of the Holy One. 48.17, and, uh, and uh, I will read on through to 18 and then to 22. It says in Isaiah 48.17, Thus says the Lord, there's one name of God, your Redeemer, another name of God, the Holy One of Israel, there's that 30-time most repeated name of God in or title of God in the book of Isaiah, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Verse 18. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Uh, the, the metaphor there is the flowing. You know, a river is not like a lake. A lake, you keep draining the water out like Mono Lake in California and it goes dry. A river keeps flowing. And he says, your peace, verse 18, if you will yield to your Redeemer, verse 17, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord your God, your peace would have been like a river. There would be a river of peace in your life and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. What does the waves of the sea do? You go out there and you tear up the beach and mess it all up. And, and when we go uh, to the east, the kids just dig holes and everything. Next morning we come, it's perfectly level and flat and all fresh again. That's what the waves of God's righteousness. He comes in, we, we, we are failures. He comes and cleanses us and washes us and makes us brand new, whiter than snow. And then we fail him again and he says, oh, my grace is greater than all your sin. And you see the picture, if we'll but yield to him, to the Holy One of Israel, we will have endless peace. doesn't mean perfection. It doesn't mean no problems, just endless peace. And we will have his endless righteousness. It doesn't mean sinlessness and it doesn't mean perfection. It means that we are forgiven and forgiven and forgiven. Well, that's who he was talking about. Look at verse 22, though, while you're there, of Isaiah 48. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. The wicked can't have peace because they won't yield to, verse 17, their Redeemer, the Holy One, and the Lord. And verse 18, they won't heed his commandments. Well, back to Mark's gospel. Let's keep digging. Uh, because we've seen, first of all, in verse 7 of chapter 1, that uh, we can dig for gold when we see what others say about Jesus Christ. In verse 7, the greatest man that ever lived, standing atop the pile of all humanity, said, I can't reach Christ, he's greater, and so he is divine. Secondly, a voice from the other side ascribes to Jesus Christ in verse 24, one of the great Old Testament titles. He says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. You know, that demon had no reason to puff Christ. I mean, he didn't, want to, he didn't want to advance the cause. He just spoke the truth. And those who met Christ face to face, and that's one thing we're going to encounter as we go through this book, the people that faced Jesus Christ in everyday life were overwhelmed with the realization of who he was. I wonder, does that happen when you come into this book? Do you get overwhelmed you know, it, it is 
It is marvelous to just come uh, before the Lord in this book. And I don't know what your plans are for the new year, but I've started my New Year's reading plans. It's marvelous just to sit there and to get all set and to pray and ask the Lord to open our eyes to see something and then to start looking and all of a sudden to be overwhelmed and captivated with a truth that draws us into the presence of our God. Well, let's turn to chapter 2, because I want to show you real quickly just five more, and, and I hope this uh, will get you started into a, a lifetime of, uh, of not just passively reading the Bible, but actively reading the Bible. Chapter 2, we're going to see a second uh, uh, facet. The first facet of a Christology is what others said about Christ. Uh, the second facet is what Jesus did, and the third facet is what Jesus said about himself. And if you take those three chords, his self-description, what he said about himself, his reputation, what others said about him, his actions, what he did, if you take those three and wind them together, you have a Christology. When you look at what he did, what he said, and what others said about him, you have a three-dimensional picture of Jesus Christ, which we call a Christology. Who he was, what he did, and, and that bound together with what others saw in him. Uh, what I want to show you now in chapter 2, the whole second chapter is all about what Jesus did. And you might want to mark these. I have these all marked in my margins. And I want you to think about living and breathing and walking every day with someone who could do this. And it's amazing to me, those disciples, the privilege they had. Verse 1 of chapter 2, again he entered Capernaum. By the way, 60% of Christ's recorded ministry is spent in a little triangle between Bethsaida, which was up on a hill, uh, Chorazim, which is over on another little hill, and Capernaum. And they each make the points of a triangle. And that triangle isn't more than about five miles total to walk between them. 60% of the Gospels are right in that little... That's why it says what he did... If, if what he did was written down, the world couldn't hold the books. I mean, because all the Gospels that we just are in amazement in, more than half of them are in that little five-mile square. He's back in this little square. He entered again into Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house, and immediately many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. You notice he, he always, when he got a crowd, gave him God's word. And they came to him, bring a paralytic man who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, you all remember this story from Sunday school, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. Now look at this. And what we're doing is studying now what Jesus did. Verse 5, first thing. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. To us, we've read that so many times. We go, oh, yeah, he forgave sins. That's why I've written in my margin. Forgives sins. Have you ever thought, though, of what they went through on a daily basis to deal with sin? They had lambs that had to be raised. They had wood that had to be carried in. They had a whole corps of thousands of priests that had to examine the lambs to make sure they were unblemished and clean. Then they had a whole crew that had to, to, to slit the throats, catch the blood, skin the, the, the thing, clean it out, throw all this refuse out by the, the, the trash pile and, and put the pieces on top of the dry wood. And then they had to burn it. And when it got all done, they had to clean out all the ashes and they had to carry the blood in and pour it. They had all of this. They had to pour it around the base of the altar, which is what they did with the blood. And all of that was not even to forgive sins. It was just to temporarily cover him. And so for, for at this point when Jesus was there, for 1,476 years, there had been literally countless lambs, goats, bulls, and pigeons slain to not forgive sins. Nobody ever had their sins forgiven back then. Just to cover them. Just to put white out over them. And they were just putting white out over everything like this. And they had a whole economy geared up to whiting out sin. And it, but it was still there. They were just covering it. They were plastering over it. It's like a landfill. They just kept putting more dirt over it. You know, and just burying the trash. And Jesus walks in. And he's sitting there. And this guy. I mean, 
he always waited for the climactic moment. I mean, he picked the moment where the demon guy staggers in, bulging eyes, and then he, he teaches them. And now the roof breaks open, and this four ropes comes down, and this body's laying on it, stiff, you know, and this guy is paralytic, can't move. And Jesus waits, and every eye is is flickering between being fastened on this this twisted body and looking at Jesus. I mean, he, all, what a climactic, he was a master of climactic moments. And look at this. With all their eyes fixed on him, he looks at that man, the paralytic, and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. No, no pigeons, no goats, no lambs, no bulls, no cutting and burning. They're gone. Right now. I, I erase them right now. Oh. I mean, look at, look at the immediate response. Some of the scribes were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts. Now, this is fascinating. If you see, again, the whole idea, this whole series where is walking with Jesus. I, what I want you to do is I want you to start thinking like, like you're there. And so, so the disciples, you know, they had pulled up a seat and they'd gotten in and they enjoyed watching the ceiling, you know, break open. They watched this guy come down. They were just enjoying this. They were fans of Jesus, you know. And, and all of a sudden this guy gets let down and they kind of stop, you know, and they look at him and they look at Jesus. And then Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. They're going, yeah, that's great. But the scribes and Pharisees were reasoning in their hearts, thinking, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? That's true. No one. No one. By the way, at at, uh, uh, the reception after the funeral, my longtime Roman Catholic uncle, who is 84 years old, for whom my mother prayed nearly her whole life, for the first time sat through a service in a Protestant church. I had, a, I had 70 of my unsaved relatives sitting just right here. First time, I mean, they couldn't miss the funeral, right? That's why I wanted to preach it. And so I preached, and I had a whole section of them. They'd never heard this before, and they'll probably never hear it again. But I remember, it was so sweet, I thought, I'm not going to push it, I'm just going to lay it out and just see what the Lord does. But my mom's older brother, who's dying of cancer, who'll be gone in March or April, they say, he feebly came up to me after the service, and he looked at me. He said, that's what I want. Now, you know, I'm not sure whether he's there yet, but you know what he told me? He says, I can't believe that the Roman Catholic Church, that that priest can forgive my sins. He says, isn't it only God can do that? I mean, here's an 84-year-old man talking like a four-year-old child. And isn't that what the Lord said? Except you come as a what? A child. You know, these, these Pharisees and, and scri- I mean, these scribes were thinking in their heart, nobody can forgive sins but God. And instead of them saying, but God is here. There he is. They're saying, he can't do that. He's not God. But look at this. Now, this is the second. Jesus, number one in verse five, forgives sins. But look at verse eight. Here's the second thing to learn about what Jesus did. But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning thus within themselves, he said, how do you like this? You're a disciple and you're going, yay, look, that guy came to the ceiling. Oh, he forgave his sins. Mm, The scribes are getting hot around the collar. And all of a sudden, you listen to Jesus, and Jesus looked at the scribes, and he lifted his eyes from the man he'd just forgiven sins, and he looked right into their eyes, and he read their thoughts. Do you know what the disciples realized? If he can read their minds, he can read mine. Do you know what they realized? He not only forgives sins, he reads minds. He knows our thoughts. 
That's the second thing you discover as you're mining for gold in the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus can read minds. He perceives and he answers their thoughts that they had never spoken. Can you imagine how unnerving it was for them? They're sitting there and they're smugly saying, this guy's blaspheming inside their minds. But, you know, on the outside they're smiling because, you know, they're supposed to be religious and everything. And Jesus said in verse 8, why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk? See, he, he heard all of them collectively. And they were saying, yeah, he picked the easy one. Nobody knows whether he forgave their sins or not. You can't see that. You can't see sins. And only God can forgive sins. And so he claimed to be God, but you can't tell. So he says, okay. You wonder about that? You wonder? Okay. But that you may know, verse 10, that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And, and again, the climactic moment. I mean, the guy through the ceiling, laying there, stiff, contorted. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And everybody was first amazed, and then they were kind of starting to doubt whether he could even do that, because only God could do that. He said to the paralytic, verse 11, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. I mean, Jesus heals this man with just a word. And and look at the the amazing response, verse 12, immediately. By the way, uh, over... 150 times you find this this concept of immediately, 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 immediately in this little book. It's constantly all the way through. And immediately he arose, took up his bed, went out in the presence of all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying we never saw anything like this. No, they hadn't. And no, they wouldn't again. Because God was in their midst. The scriptures tell us that Jesus is divine. And he's so much higher than all of humanity that we're not worthy. We can't reach him. And if we do get into his presence, we do not even have the right or the authority or even even any reason to even be able to untie his shoes. Did you know that was the job of the lowest slave? When you walked into someone's house... You just put out your foot, and this slave would never even look up at you, and he would take your your shoe off, and he'd wash your foot and put a little slipper on it, and you'd stick out your other one, and they still wouldn't look up, and they'd undo your sandal, and your feet were all dirty from the road, and you'd hold it out, and they'd wash it, and they'd dry it off and put on a sandal, and you wouldn't say a word to them, you wouldn't say thank you, and you'd just walk by them and go into the meal, because they were a piece of, of machinery that belonged in the house. That's the first century. And Jesus said, you and I, compared to his excellency of deity, the greatest human doesn't rise above. They don't even have the authority to get up and to untie his shoe. But yet Jesus says, come boldly to me at my table and come and eat in my presence with me as my brother and as my sister. Let's close this little study by going back to the book of Revelation. It says in Revelation 4, 8, The four living creatures, each having six wings, full of eyes around within, do not rest night or day, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, verse 10, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne to worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. You know, the 24 elders, 12 representing the Old Testament, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 representing the 12 apostles, the new, new people of God, All the redeemed people of God, whenever God is magnified and glorified and worshipped, 
They just can't go in their normal mode. They have to humble themselves, even glorified. You know what's amazing in America? We went to Russia this past summer, and all of us, seven men, seven elders, eight, I guess eight of us, uh, leaders from the church, we got there, and as soon as we got there, they said, let's pray. And we were all sitting down. They said, you can't sit down to pray. We said, oh, why? They said, you can't sit in the presence of God. You have to either stand or kneel. You know, in America, uh, we don't think reverently. I'd like to remind you that the one that you've come to eat a, a memorial feast for his death in our place, the one who John the Baptist, the greatest living human being up to that day, that he is so great that we don't even have the right in our human merit to touch him to get close enough to him but he by his grace has said you can enter boldly into my presence with exceeding great joy but when we see the redeemed coming before him it says in verse 9 whenever they give honor and thanks to him that sits on the throne that verse 10 they fall down before him <laughs> 